A missing man surfaces in a Texas swamp. Strapped to his chest is a chilling record of his final minutes. Texas Rangers hope it will help unravel a case of double homicide. Police have a suspect in a cold-blooded killing, just not the technology to match him to the crime. Will science catch up to the killer before he slips away for good? When a body appears on the side of a Texas interstate, detectives hit the road to stop a homicidal trucker in his tracks. In Texas, there's plenty of room to hide. But killers in the Lone Star State, be warned. Even the swiftest of criminals can't escape the long arm of the Texas Rangers. July 27, 1982, Texas Rangers were called to an abandoned car in a remote drainage ditch near Santa Rosa. The inside had been torched. A check of the plates showed that the car was registered to Billy Staten, who, along with his girlfriend, Letty Castro, had been missing for 10 days. It was the first break in the case, and one that Rangers desperately needed. Once the car was pulled from the swamp, investigators noticed something even more suspicious. A rock had been set on the accelerator. It appeared that a deliberate attempt had been made to get rid of the car and conceal a crime. But the fire and days of exposure to the elements had erased all fingerprints and ruined any chance of linking the crime to a suspect. The rock was the only clue authorities had to lead them to the missing couple. But if the condition of the car was any indication, things didn't look good for Billy Staten and Letty Castro. Texas Ranger Bruce Castile feared the worst. Well, after finding the vehicle, we started an extensive search with numerous individuals searching canals, brushy areas, in an attempt to find Lefty Castro and, and Billy Staten. We felt like at that time that uh, they had been uh, murdered. Rangers combed the area for the bodies, certain that they couldn't be too far from the scorched car. They trudged through miles of dense brush along the drainage ditch for any sign of the couple. After four days of searching, they still had found nothing. But the rangers weren't discouraged. They built a reputation on their ability to solve extremely difficult cases. The Texas Rangers were organized in 1823 by Stephen F. Austin to protect the first settlers of Texas from Indians. Fifty years later, in the rowdy days of the Wild West, the Rangers earned their name as tough lawmen by tracking down bandits, bank robbers, horse thieves, and cattle rustlers. Today, Rangers are as tenacious as ever. As a state police agency, they're highly trained in investigative and forensic techniques to assist local law enforcement. The Texas Rangers tackle only the biggest and most complex criminal cases. And the simple missing persons case was becoming more difficult with every day. Rangers question Letty Castro's brother, who told authorities that he last saw the couple on July 16th when he stopped by the trailer she shared with Billy Staten. 
That was the same day they left to pick up Staten's nine-year-old daughter at his ex-wife's house. The two were going to be married soon and hoped to obtain full-time custody of the girl. But their dreams disappeared just as quickly as they did. The Rangers also learned from Letty Castro's brother of the Staten's ugly custody battle. Billy Staten retained rights to keep his daughter every other weekend. His ex-wife Sherry didn't like to comply. Pickups were an especially distressing time. On checking up on Staten's ex-wife, Rangers learned that Sherry and her new husband, Paul Wolfe, had moved the day after Billy Staten and Letty Castro disappeared. About four or five days, be my guess. When Rangers caught up with them, they claimed that okay, Staten yeah. never showed up to pick up his daughter. You bet. Just keep you posted, George. Good to see y'all. Take care. You bet. The Rangers obtained a warrant to search the home that Paul and Sherry had vacated. A damp spot on the carpet encouraged detectives to probe a little further. What they found was puzzling. A small area on the back side of the carpet had been painted over. It seemed like a deliberate attempt had been made to cover something up. Sections of the carpet were shipped to the lab to see if technicians could determine anything. Agents tested the carpet. So they wouldn't destroy potential evidence, they removed some of the residue with a cotton swab. A chemical that changes color in the presence of blood was then added to the swab. The test was positive. The blood was human. Because of the limits of technology in 1982 and the contamination by the paint, they could not determine whose blood it was. But they discovered that the carpet contained a lot of it. And someone had gone to a lot of trouble to hide it. Upon closer examination at the house, investigators discovered tiny spatters of blood on the walls and curtains. They collected samples to send to the lab. If the bodies were ever found, the blood types could be compared. Something had definitely happened in the house. But the most interesting piece of evidence was found outside the home. It wasn't so much evidence as the absence of evidence. But it was rock solid. Ranger criminalist Joe Marchand uncovered precisely what had happened. And we looked around and we finally found an indentation next to a tree where a rock used to be. So we went ahead and we had the rock at the time and we went back and we basically fit it back as a jigsaw puzzle and put it back in its place. Putting these pieces together, the Rangers turned to Paul Wolf, the husband of Billy Staten's ex-wife. This time, he changed his story. Paul now admitted that Billy and Letty Castro had arrived to pick up Billy's daughter. He told Rangers that Sherry and the girl weren't home when Billy arrived. Billy was so mad to find that his daughter wasn't there that he attacked Paul. Paul tried to defend himself and accidentally killed Billy with a metal bar. Billy's fiancée, Letty, heard the commotion and came running in. When she saw Billy on the floor covered with blood, she came after Paul. Once again, Paul Wolfe said he beat her in self-defense, accidentally killing her too. Shocked and scared by what he'd done, Paul asked a buddy, Glenn Henderson, to help him dump the bodies in a drainage ditch. To get rid of Billy's car, he'd brought a large rock along to set on the accelerator, hoping to get the car to drive itself into the ditch. But 
but it hadn't worked the way he'd planned, so he returned the next day and burned it. Paul Wolf admitted that he had lied the first time because he was confused and wasn't sure the Rangers would buy his story. Wolf then directed investigators to the bodies. Letty Castro's body was found floating in a drainage ditch 12 miles from where the car was located. Her skull showed the damage Paul Wolf described. But Rangers also saw that she'd been shot in the head. It didn't match Wolf's confession. Clearly, he was lying. About 10 miles away, Billy Staten's body was found partially submerged in a steep canal. His head was crushed. When the body was dragged out, the detectives made a peculiar discovery. Under his shirt, strapped around his waist, was a mini tape recorder. It was in bad shape from the water, but the cassette inside was still intact. It was a puzzling find. Rangers couldn't explain why Billy wore a tape recorder to his ex-wife's house, but they knew there was the possibility that Billy Staten had recorded his own murder. The Texas Rangers believed that the clue that would seal their case was taped to Billy Staten's body. The tape recorder found on the victim was treated with tremendous care. Days of water and mud had ruined most of the mechanism. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. But crime scene analyst Joe Marchand was hopeful about salvaging the cassette. The most fascinating piece of evidence that we found was the tape recorder that was strapped to Billy Staten's stomach. Uh, we pulled the tape out. Uh, we called the FBI laboratory and asked them, what are we supposed to do? And they said, has it been submerged in water? Uh, partially, they said, good, put it back in water and send it to us in a container. And it's better to be in water than, than letting the tape dry out. After 10 long days, the tape was returned to the Texas Rangers. The FBI had done their best to save whatever had been recorded, but it was still uncertain whether it contained anything vital to the case. Within seconds of playing it, the sounds of Billy Staten being brutally murdered were perfectly clear. Armed with the recording, investigators went back to the scene of the crime to precisely match actions to audio. They measured distances and timed out the events as they corresponded to the sounds on the tape. The blood found in the house had been matched to Billy Staten. Now the patterns of the blood would tell more of the story. All the blood stains on the wall had tiny tails like teardrops. By studying and measuring those tails, Examiners could determine exactly what angles the blood had come from. Combined with the audio tape, they could then piece together where Billy was in the room at the time he was beaten. Now, what you, now what you go ahead and pass it on the road. The tape revealed to investigators exactly what happened that afternoon. Billy Staten showed up at the house and was invited in. Billy's here. Sherry Wolf and her daughter are clearly heard on the tape, refuting Paul's claims that they weren't home when Billy arrived. Detectives learned that soon after Billy's arrival, Wolf took out the trash. But the trash was just an excuse to get outside. He really just wanted to see if Billy had brought Letty with him, and he needed to grab the crowbar he'd hidden earlier. From the way the blood had spattered on the walls, and by listening carefully to the tape, it was obvious to Rangers that Billy Staten had no idea what was about to happen. 
He was seated, waiting patiently, when Paul Wolf struck. Wolf's accomplice, Glenn Henderson, had been hiding in another room. Once their victim was slumped on the floor, the two went out to murder Letty, who was waiting in the car. Without a doubt, Paul Wolf's self-defense plea was a lie. These were cold-blooded attacks on unsuspecting people. While the tape continued to roll, the killers carried Billy out to his car and put him in the trunk. They knew they'd need to get rid of the car, as well as the bodies, and they took the rock with them. The fact that the murder weapons were planted and an accomplice was on hand helped to prove that these weren't spur-of-the-moment murders. They were planned in advance. Of course, what they didn't plan on was capturing their crime on tape. And this is where they're looking. This is where they're looking to see where they're going to dump Letty. And you can hear the rocks hitting the bottom of the trunk and they're traveling slow speed. Wolf found a secluded area off a drainage ditch a few miles from the house. Glenn Henderson followed in his truck. The site was far off the road and the grass was high enough to conceal a dead body. something was wrong, Letty Castro was still alive. The killers, however, were prepared for such a hitch. On the tape, you hear a single gunshot. Uh, then you hear some yelling, which is uh, inaudible. Uh, then you hear the car door close in the vehicle and take off. And approximately 30 seconds later, the tape runs out. For some reason, they decided not to dump both bodies at the same spot. They left their next victim nine miles down the road. The car was disposed of just as Wolf had described. The hard work was over. Back at the house, there was quite a bit of cleaning to do. In the short time they'd left their victim inside, struggling for life, a large pool of blood had collected on the carpet. The co-conspirators had to rent a professional carpet cleaner to cover their tracks. But even that wasn't enough. Blood had seeped through the carpet, staining the underside. In an attempt to conceal it, they painted over the spots. To put the crime behind them, the Wolfs went so far as to move out of the house the day after the murders. But nothing they could do would erase the evidence that Billy Staten had unwittingly recorded. Rangers discovered that Billy had warned the recorder on his lawyer's advice. He'd wanted to capture the appalling confrontation and Sherry's malicious behavior, hoping it could help him obtain custody of his daughter. Instead, he recorded his own murder. <laughs> Paul and Sherry Wolf were both sentenced to life in prison for killing Billy Staten and Letty Castro. For his part, Glenn Henderson also received a life sentence. Most criminals unintentionally leave evidence behind, evidence that can condemn. But sometimes the proof is worthless. When even the latest technology can't finger a killer, all detectives can do is wait until science catches up. It was the morning of January 22nd, 1988. 
when Texas Rangers were summoned to a secluded farmhouse in Burleson County. They'd been called to check up on an elderly woman who lived by herself. Neighbors couldn't reach her on the phone, but there was concern that something might have happened. They were right. 72-year-old Lydia Schumacher had been murdered. Inside, rangers discovered the gruesome scene. Schumacher lay partially nude on her bed. The sheets were bloody. She'd been bludgeoned and then smothered to death. The Texas Ranger Crime Lab in Austin was called in to process the house for evidence. Someone had clearly broken in the back door and it seemed some jewelry was missing. Apparently, Mrs. Schumacher had surprised a burglar. There were no fingerprints to be collected and the weapon used to beat her couldn't be found. It was likely that she was smothered with her own pillow. Officers turned their attention to the body and the bed. Serologist Donna Stanley, an expert in biological evidence, examined the crime scene and found signs that the victim had been raped. So um, what we then did was we began to unravel the bed sheet by sheet. And, and from doing that, we, we covered any hair that we saw on the sheets and the, and the bedspread. Donna, that was where it became that apparent at that body. moment that we might have been dealing with more with uh, more than just with a homicide, that we might have had a sexual assault involved. To track down the killer, rangers began interviewing people in the area for any information. Within a week, rangers had questioned all of Schumacher's friends and neighbors. No one could understand who could rape and murder such a sweet old woman. But eventually, three names came up of men who for one reason or another were considered suspicious by their neighbors. Detectives asked the men if they'd be willing to take a polygraph test. One by one, they were brought into the station, hooked up to the machine, and asked point blank if they murdered Schumacher or had any knowledge of the murder. Texas Ranger Bob Connell was in charge of the case. We had several suspects uh, in the course of the investigation. One of them was a next door neighbor. And another one was uh, a person who uh, was later picked up for indecent exposure. Two men were questioned and released. The third suspect was a young man named Charles Supak, Jr. Supak and his father had actually been doing some work at the Schumacher house on the day she was murdered. A background check revealed he'd once been charged with sexual assault. He was subjected to a thorough interrogation about the crime, but he denied any involvement whatsoever. The polygraph confirmed that Supak was telling the truth. No, sir. All three suspects had passed the test, and rangers were now left empty-handed. With no more leads, all they could do was hope to make the best of what they had so far. Pretty good. At the crime lab in Austin, Donna Stanley and her colleagues ran tests on the biological evidence left by the rapist. Once they determined the killer's blood type, they compared it to hair samples taken from the three suspects. Out of the three suspects that I tested, two of them were immediately eliminated. The third remained as an inclusion in the blood typing test, and that was Supak. He was not eliminated on ABO typing. In 1988, ABO blood typing narrowed down evidence to one of only eight blood types. 
But with hundreds of millions of people sharing Supac's type, the test results were hardly enough to prove anything. Still, it was all they had to work with, so Rangers brought Supac in again. He had passed the first polygraph test, but investigators were confident that if he were guilty, Supac couldn't beat the machine twice in a row. They decided to try again. It wasn't difficult finding him. He was sitting in jail for possession of marijuana. Did you rape Rangers Mr. felt that if he'd been under the influence of drugs during the first Did test, he could Schumann. have possibly lied and still That's passed. On the second go round, he Did had been in jail for several days, and we knew that he had to be clean at that time. So we took him back for the second polygraph, to the same operator, and he passed that one too. No other evidence was found that could pin the murder on Supac. Authorities had no choice but to clear him of the charges. For nearly a year, Rangers struggled to find Schumacher's killer, but it was hopeless. On November 29, 1988, they finally had to suspend the case. A rapist and murderer roamed somewhere in the Lone Star State, and the Texas Rangers were powerless to stop him. It had been three years since Lydia Schumacher was brutally raped and murdered. The only suspect was cleared of all responsibility, and the case sat on the shelf collecting dust. But by 1991, science had advanced enough to warrant another look at the case. Serologist Donna Stanley from the Texas Ranger Crime Lab felt that the new technologies held promise. We still had a little bit of evidence left, kind of hanging on to it, hoping that as a new technology came along, we might then be able to apply this evidence to that new technology and gain, yet again, some more information. I need to pull that file okay. for some new The first comparisons made between suspect Charles Supak's hair and body fluids found that the crime scene had been inconclusive. Forensic examiners had done all they could do. But since the initial investigation, a revolutionary new method for analyzing DNA had been developed. Called PCR, it enables scientists to get DNA from tiny samples, like a single strand of hair or a speck of blood, something they could never do before. Stanley was optimistic that the evidence collected from the Schumacher house three years earlier could finally be used to nail the killer. Okay, see you around. Shortly after the case had closed, Sheriff Connell had retired and Texas Ranger Ray Kaufman took his place. Kaufman approved further investigation of the evidence and quickly reopened the file. Okay, well thanks, Bob. Leave something. At the time I got involved in the Shupak murder, I knew that DNA was making giant leaps in uh, their ability to uh, narrow down suspects, and I felt that this case was one that uh, possibly DNA could so help solve. As the preserved evidence was sent to a genetics lab, rangers began questioning neighbors and relatives again, hoping to uncover more information about Charles Supak. They soon learned things about their suspect they'd never heard before. Shocking facts that made authorities only more suspicious than ever. Neighbors confided that Supak had quite a disturbing reputation. It was widely reported that he had unusual sex habits, including bestiality. But the most helpful information came from a man who recalled a strange and frightening night with Charles Supak. About four months after the murder, John Goldson was awakened late one night by Charles Supak. He told Goldson that he'd had car trouble and needed help. But something about Supak's manner didn't seem right. John reluctantly agreed to drive him back to his car. Where are we going? The man just going out this way. While they drove around aimlessly, trying to find the car, 
Goldson's suspicions slowly turned to fear. Supak had insisted on sitting directly behind Goldson and spent the entire drive idly wrapping an electrical cord around his hands. Supak finally directed Goldson to a remote area, but when they arrived, his vehicle was nowhere to be seen. Tired of the whole affair, Goldson finally drove him to the garage. When Goldson got home, he still felt uneasy. He and his wife inspected the grounds and found that their phone lines had been cut. The story took another chilling twist when Golson showed rangers where he'd driven Supak that night. Golson had no idea of the significance of the spot, but its importance didn't escape the rangers. Golson's trip with Supak led rangers to believe that their old suspect knew more about the Schumacher murder than he'd admitted. This is the final location where Mr. Shupak brought Mr. Golson that night. Shupak said he'd parked his vehicle down or got it stuck down here by this tree line. This little lane here goes down to the Shoemaker residence. It's maybe a quarter of a mile right down here. Shupak had returned to the Shoemaker estate. Rangers knew it was common for a killer to revisit the crime scene, but it would take more than this circumstantial evidence to put the finger on Charles Shupak. The lab had run complex DNA tests, comparing Supak's sample to the evidence from the Schumacher case. Finally, on March 8, 1992, the results came in. The DNA of Charles Supak Jr. was in the victim's bed sheets. The updated information finally gave Texas Rangers the evidence they needed to arrest the man they'd suspected for over five years. Once again, he was in another Texas County Jail for vehicle theft. Faced with the undeniable DNA evidence, Supak admitted to raping and murdering Lydia Schumacher. In his confession, Supak told Rangers that on January 20th, 1988, he and his father had finished some work they'd been doing around Mrs. Schumacher's house and were ready to call it a day. They'd spent nearly a week on the property, and Charles had been inside the house enough to know that Mrs. Schumacher owned some gold jewelry. He figured there had to be more valuable somewhere in the house. That night, Supak returned. He claimed he'd been driving around looking for something to steal when he thought of Mrs. Schumacher. Her house was terribly secluded, and she was elderly and defenseless. The house was quiet when he arrived, and getting in was easy. He'd left a pipe in the yard that day. Now it was the perfect tool, and soon it would be the perfect weapon. Once inside, the prowler had a look around. He snuck into her bedroom and began rifling through her things when she awoke. Supak reacted by beating her in the head with the pipe. Before he left, he raped her and suffocated her with a pillow. It took nearly five years, but Charles Supak Jr. was finally convicted and sentenced to life for the murder of Lydia Schumacher. The conviction was a tribute to Ranger tenacity as much as it was a victory of hard science. Forensic science basically uh, solved this case. If it hadn't been for the advances in DNA, I'm sure this would still be a pending case that would go unsolved. 
It's easier to catch a killer, even years after his crime, if he stays put. But rangers take pride in their ability to track down suspects on the run. In a state as big as Texas, it's a common situation. There's usually not much to see on Interstate 35 between Dallas and Oklahoma. But on August 8, 1994, that changed. A Cook County police officer spotted a body on the roadside near the Oklahoma state line. When Texas Rangers arrived on the scene, they found a dead white male in his 30s. He had been stabbed multiple times in the chest, neck, and face. Wrapped around his neck was a shoelace. There was a sock stuffed in his mouth. Judging from the condition of his body, it looked like he had been thrown from a moving vehicle. A bra and a baseball cap were discovered nearby. A pair of men's underwear were also recovered. There were obscure clues, but it was enough to start rangers down the right road. Officers searched the body, but found no wallet or ID. The murder victim was transported to the lab, where fingerprints were taken for identification. The task of tracking down the killer fell to Texas Ranger Johnny Waldrop. Within two days, he received a positive identification of the victim from the fingerprints. He was a 38-year-old Dallas man. His name was James Sykes. James Sykes had a real bad criminal history and uh, was just a uh, kind of a throwaway person. Uh, he didn't uh, have any family background other than his parents and he had no money and had no job and, and was a very bad drug addict and an extensive criminal history. Uh, roadblocks we ran into is through the investigation and we would contact people and they would say, why do you care? Well, we did care because he was an individual just like everyone else. Door. Sykes hung with a rough crowd. When officers tracked down his best friend, Murray Bracken, he was in a Dallas County jail on a drug charge, and he became the Ranger's first suspect. Bracken admitted that he'd been with Sykes just the day before his body was discovered. He even acknowledged that the baseball cap found at the scene belonged to him. But he was adamant that he had nothing to do with the murder. Bracken recounted that he and Sykes were partying at a motel when they met a truck driver and his girlfriend. The four used up Bracken's drugs, and at the end of the party, he asked the truck driver to pay his share. The truck driver didn't have the money with him, but said he could go get it. James Sykes went with the couple to make sure they didn't just take off. That was August 7th. Murray sent Sykes with the truck driver to collect the money. The truck driver, for some unknown reason, gave his billfold with his driver's license to Bracken and said, I'm from Ada, Oklahoma. I'm a truck driver. I've got to be in Phoenix in a couple of days. And this is good faith. I will leave my billfold with you, showing you that I'll come back with the money. They never returned. And Murray Bracken said he emptied the trucker's wallet and threw away his driver's license. Unfortunately, that was the one piece of evidence that would have supported his story and provided a solid lead for Rangers. Now, it was gone forever. To see if Bracken was telling the truth, 
Waldrop called the Oklahoma Department of Motor Vehicles to check for truckers who'd applied for duplicate licenses in the last few days. The DMV gave him a list. On it was a man named Terry Brown. He was from Ada, Oklahoma. Police records revealed that Brown had been stopped on a traffic violation shortly before the murder. At the time, he was driving a truck registered to a freight company in Carrollton, Texas. He finished his job and returned the truck to the company. But shortly afterwards, someone stole it off the lot. Brown was arrested for driving the stolen rig two days later, but was released on bond. Dallas police sent Waldrop his mugshot. Hey, thanks for coming Rangers in. put uh, the picture in a stack of photos and asked man. Murray Bracken to Terry survey Brown. the lineup. <coughs> Within moments, he recognized the trucker he'd last seen with his friend. He pointed out Terry Brown. The investigation was picking up steam but to prove Brown was the killer, okay. Rangers needed more than just the word of a criminal. They needed proof. The freight company was relieved to get their stolen truck back. Only now it was the major piece of evidence in a crime far worse than theft. It matched a description Bracken had given authorities, and they were beginning to believe that it was in the truck that James Sykes had taken his last ride. The Dallas Police Crime Lab was called in to search the vehicle for any signs that the victim had been inside. Rangers knew Brown had been in the cab. He was arrested in it. Trucking records showed he was driving on business until August 6th. Sometime after that, he returned to the lot and stole the truck. The company reported the rig missing, and it was recovered on the 8th, the same day the body was found. Everything pointed to Terry Brown as the killer, but Brown had jumped bail. No one knew where he was. The team scoured the cab and sleeper for clues. They got what they were looking for. In the back on the walls, investigators found some small spots of what appeared to be blood. Careful examination revealed even more blood under the mattress. Some quick tests indicated that it was human. Detectives were sure that further testing would reveal it to be the blood of James Sykes. The evidence was bagged and sent to the lab for DNA testing. Rangers were confident they were now on the trail of the man responsible for the brutal stabbing. At the lab, criminalist Wilson Young used DNA testing to compare the blood to that of the victim. But what he found shocked Rangers and presented a major roadblock to the investigation. Uh, we did a, a type on it, we did a DNA type on it, and uh, found that actually from that rig that we investigated at that particular time, the blood didn't match the victim that we were looking for. We had some blood here, but uh, didn't match the, the person we was supposed to match. They'd found blood in the truck, but it wasn't the blood they'd expected to find. Apparently, someone else might possibly have been murdered there. Then Ranger Waldrop received news that only complicated issues further. Another female was found and she had a ligature around her neck and a sock in her mouth. And of course, uh, we found Sykes with a ligature string around his neck, a sock in his mouth. So my initial gut reaction was that, that Murray Bracken was telling the truth and that we probably have a serial killer out there driving a truck. The case had taken an unexpected turn. At least two people were dead, and a serial killer was loose on the interstates of America. 
If Waldrip didn't catch up to him soon, there would almost certainly be more dead bodies to identify down the road. The Texas murders didn't stop. On November 7th, Ranger Waldrip received a call from police in Richardson, Texas, a town just north of Dallas. They'd just found another body. It was a woman with a string tied around her neck and a sock stuffed in her mouth. But this time, there was a twist. The dead woman was Terry Brown's mother. Brown and his girlfriend, Tina Sampson, were prime suspects in the murder. They had stolen his mother's car and disappeared. When Waldrip talked to Brown's last employer, he discovered that Brown was supposed to have delivered a load to California. He would picked up their truck on November 6th, the day before the murder, and never returned. Once again, Terry Brown had stolen a rig and vanished. Uh, we were very fortunate at this time. Uh, we finally had a turn of luck. Uh, this was the truck we were looking for. Uh, we found that he drove the truck to Oklahoma City and partied in it for a few days, and it ran out of gas, and he left it. Uh, the Oklahoma City police found the truck abandoned. Before Rangers had time to respond, the trucking company brought the semi back to Texas and had it cleaned. The crime lab was sent to search for any possible clues that might have survived the cleaning. Fortunately, the company hadn't wiped away all the evidence. Stains in the sleeper under the mattress were found that were most likely caused by blood. Judging by the size of the stains, it appeared that a lot of blood had seeped through the mattress onto the platform but this was clearly a brand new mattress. The company had thrown out the old one and with it some evidence vital to the murder case. Through a stroke of luck, the trash hadn't been collected yet and among the trash was an old stained mattress. The large stains looked like blood and matched the stains in the truck. Detectives were concerned that days of exposure had taken its toll on the evidence. Everything was shipped to a lab in Austin for detailed analysis. At the lab, DNA was extracted from the evidence. The strands were chemically cut into smaller pieces. This allowed for an extremely precise comparison between the blood found in the truck and the sample from James Sykes. I'm gonna need the light out. By comparing the DNA fragments, technicians confirmed that the blood could match only one person in the entire world, James Sykes. We were certain that the, the victim's blood was in the truck, in fact, uh, I mean, when you look at the numbers, one in 5.5 billion, that pretty much indicates that that particular person was the only one that could have left the blood behind in the truck. Terry Brown and Tina Sampson were found the next day. Dallas police caught up with the couple in his mother's stolen car, headed east. We'll find that out in the court of law. They were split up and interrogated separately. She's telling the truth right now. Once the evidence was presented before them, investigators were finally told the true story of what happened to James Sykes. He was trying to rape Tina. She had him by knife point. To make sure they paid what they owed, Sykes had gone with them to collect the money. Brown drove to a truck stop and told Sykes to wait in the truck while he went to get the cash. But Sykes grew impatient and decided to collect his money another way. According to the killers, he climbed in the back and demanded sex from Tina Sampson. 
She panicked and pulled a knife to defend herself. When Brown returned and saw the two arguing, he assumed Sykes was trying to rape his girlfriend. In a fit of anger, he grabbed the knife and stabbed Sykes. Sampson said she was so upset, she took the knife and stabbed him some more. Brown wrapped a ligature around his victim's neck and stuffed a sock in his mouth. Sampson said they left his body in the back for a while until they were ready to dispose of him. And she told us about how they had driven around a couple of days later, had partied some more, done some more drugs while he was in the sleeper of the truck and that they later decided to go to Oklahoma City and along the route she didn't know where they were but they would pulled up on the side of the interstate and that Terry had got in the sleeper and just with his feet had pushed the body out the side door on the long side of the interstate and then they went to Oklahoma City. Though investigators couldn't get a conviction for the other two murders, Tina Sampson got 20 years for conspiracy to murder and Terry Brown got life in prison for the death of James Sykes. The determination of the Texas Rangers paid off. Well, this case I think epitomizes the Rangers that we have done for so many years. Uh, there's a very old Ranger saying that uh, a man in the wrong cannot stand up against a man in the right that keeps on coming. And that's what we did in this case. We kept on coming. The Rangers made their reputation over a hundred years ago by stubbornly chasing criminals through all sorts of terrain using any weapon available. And they're still at it, armed with the power of forensic science. Killers may continue to run from the law. But with technology as their sidekick, the Texas Rangers will never stop their relentless pursuit.